Hey folks, welcome back. This is the second video in a three-part series on topological data analysis, or TDA for short. In this video, I'll be talking about a specific technique under the umbrella of TDA called the mapper algorithm. What this approach allows you to do is translate your data into an interactive graphical representation, which enables things like exploratory data analysis and finding new patterns in your data. I'll start with a discussion of how the algorithm works before diving into a concrete example with code. And with that, let's get into the video. So in the previous video, I discussed a famous problem in math called the Seven Bridges of Konigsberg. So I won't go into all the details of the problem, but it was eventually solved by a famous mathematician, Leonard Euler, and the way he solved it was by drawing a picture. And this picture is what we now call a graph. And so a graph consists of dots connected by lines. More technical term for these things, the dots are called vertices and the lines are called edges. Another equivalent terminology is instead of calling this thing a graph, we can call it a network and we can call the dots nodes and we can call the lines links. So these are all equivalent terminology that I'll probably use interchangeably for this video. And so graphs or networks, they typically represent something from the real world. World. So in this case, Euler drew a graph representing Konigsberg, where each of the nodes represented a landmass and each of the lines connecting two nodes represented a bridge. And so what this does is it boils down the problem to its essential elements. And this is what allowed Euler to famously solve this problem. And as I mentioned in the previous video, this is essentially what we're doing when we do topological data analysis. We are translating data from the real world into its essential elements, or in other words, into its underlying shape. And so one way of doing this is via the mapper algorithm and the main topic of this video. So the mapper algorithm allows us to translate data into a graph. So key applications of the mapper algorithm, one is exploratory data analysis. It allows us to take a data set and generate a visually engaging and interactive visualization. Another application is that it allows you to compress and visualize very high dimensional data. So imagine trying to visualize a 500 dimensional data set. With the mapper algorithm, we can take our data set, compress it into a two dimensional graph, and then visualize it and try to highlight some key insights. And we saw some examples of this in the previous video with discovery of cancer subtypes, defining new roles in basketball, and characterizing the evolution of the two political parties in the US. So at a super high level, the mapper algorithm takes data and translates it into a graph, but how exactly does it work? I've broken down the algorithm into five steps, and I apologize in advance because it's a bit sophisticated, but I will do my best to explain it in plain English. So the first step is we start with our data set. So here we have a two-dimensional data set because we have two variables, x1 and x2. Then the second step is we project our data into a lower dimensional space. So here we're going from two dimensions and we're projecting down to one dimension. And we can do this with any dimensionality reduction strategy you like. We can do something standard like PCA. We can do something more sophisticated as we will see in the example later. Another popular strategy is to take just basic statistics to project down to one dimension. In other words, you could consider two variables x1 and x2. So each point will have a corresponding x1 and x2 value. You could take the average of those two and organize them onto a one dimensional axis. And you could take the max, you could take the min. So there are all these different strategies. So we've gone from two dimensions down to one dimension. So nothing too fancy yet. So the next step is we define something called a cover. So basically what this means is we're going to define two subsets indicated by this red circle and this green circle. And we will have these two subsets have some overlap. So we can see here that the red subset and the green subset indeed have some overlap. And these are indicated by the yellow points in the center of this picture. And so that's what we mean by cover. We just define a collection of subsets that have some overlap, which include the entirety of the data set. Another thing is we could do more than just two subsets. We could have three subsets, four subsets, and so on. But just for this toy example, I chose two v 
because it's easy to see what's going on here. Okay, and then the fourth step is we cluster the pre-image. There's a lot of jargon here, so I'm just gonna break it down. So if we look at step three, we have these red points, green points, and yellow points. But if we remember that each of these points has a corresponding point in our original data set. So what's being shown in this picture in step four is our original data set, but the points are colored based on which subset they appear in from step three. And so the next step is we're going to iteratively go through all our subsets. So we only have two subsets. We have a red subset and green subset, and we're going to apply our favorite clustering algorithm. We'll start with this red subset. So in other words, we're going to look at the red and yellow points only, and we're going to do a clustering algorithm. And let's say it looks something like this, that we will go to our next subset, which is the green and yellow points here, and we will cluster those. And let's say we get something like this. So now we have these four clusters to find with some overlap between them. Now we're set up to create a graph. So we can create a graph where the nodes are these clusters. So four nodes corresponding to four clusters. And then two nodes are connected by an edge if the clusters have shared members. So this middle cluster shares members with the other three. And so that's what's being shown here. Okay, so this is just a toy example. I hope that was somewhat clear of what's going on here, but I'm going to try to make things more concrete with an example with code. So in this example, we're gonna do exploratory data analysis of S&P 500 data. So our first step is to import some modules. So we have the Yahoo Finance module, which allows us to get the stock data. We have this KMapper module, which allows us to do the mapper algorithm stuff. So we're importing this UMAP module, uh, sklearn, and then something from sklearn, and we're using these for our dimensionality reduction. And then we have NumPy and Matplotlib to do some standard math and visualization stuff. Okay, so the first step, as with any data science project, is you're gonna get your data. So this is pretty straightforward. You just define your ticker names and you define the date range for which you want your data. And then with one line of code, you can pull all that data. And so this code is available on the GitHub. Everything should just work out of the box. And once we have our data, we can do some more preparation to make it ready to go to do our analysis. So the first step is we're just gonna look at adjusted close prices. And so now what you can imagine is we have cost columns corresponding to ticker names. And then we have rows, which are corresponding to days that the market's open. And then what we're gonna do is convert this pandas data frame into a NumPy array. And then we're gonna standardize each of the columns. So basically what that means is we're gonna consider a column, compute its mean and standard deviation. And then we're gonna subtract the mean from each value in this column. And we're gonna divide it by the standard deviation. And then the last step here is we do a transpose just because later this will allow us to compare tickers together as opposed to day so we could also not do a transpose and then the analysis wouldn't so much be comparing different tickers together, but comparing days that the market was open. And then the last step here is we're gonna compute the percent return of each of the tickers because later when we generate this interactive network, we can color the nodes in the network based on the percent return value of each of the tickers. Okay, so all this talking and explaining and we still haven't really gotten into any topological data analysis. So if we think back to that visual overview from earlier, this is all still step one. We're still getting our data. Uh, so now we can finally get into the mapper algorithm stuff. First, we will initialize this object. Next, we're gonna do step two in the process, which is project our data into a lower dimensional space. So we actually have 495 tickers here. And what we're gonna do is project that down into two dimensions. And the way we do this is a two-step process. First, we use isomath from this manifold library in sklearn. So that'll take us from 495 dimensions down to 100. Then we'll use umap, which will take us further from 100 down to two dimensions. So the nice thing about this syntax is we can define a custom data pipeline to do our dimensionality reduction. So we can see this projection keyword is being set to a list. And this list is actually a list of functions. Element in this list is manifold.isomap with all the input arguments there. And then the second element of the list is umap with all its input arguments. But we could have gone further. We could have added a third element and made that PCA, which took us from two components down to one component. Or we could have done a completely different data processing pipeline. So you can already start to see that you have a lot of flexibility in using the mapper algorithm in practice. So we essentially will combine steps three, <laughs> four, and five from the overview earlier into one line of code. So defining a cover, clustering the pre-image, and generating 
making an output graph is all compressed down to a single function call. In that, we pass in the projected data from the previous step, the original data set, and we define the clustering strategy that we want to use. Here we use a DB scan with a cosine similarity metric. Yeah, you can also customize the details of the cover, but here we're just using the default values. And in less than a second, it generates the graph. And so the next step here, I define a file ID, which isn't really necessary. I just like to do it because every time I've used the mapper algorithm, I'll try different choices of cover. I'll try different projection strategies. I'll try different clustering algorithms and so on. And I'll typically have these going in a for loop and I don't want the output graphs to get overwritten. So I'll define this file ID, which will automatically generate a unique file name for each output graph. And then the last step is we visualize the network. You just pass in the graph, you define a file name, you can give the graph a title. You can have these custom tooltips, which is the label for each of the members. So basically this is our ticker names. We can define color values, which we will define as the log percent returns. We can give a name to the color function. And then we can also have multiple options of how these color values are aggregated. So we could just do a simple average. We could compute the standard deviation, the sum, the max, the min, and so on. And so what the output of the mapper algorithm looks like is something like this. It actually generates a web page, which allows you to interact with the graph and lends itself very well to exploratory data analysis, which we're doing right now. Okay, so the code that we just walked through will actually generate an HTML file, which we can go ahead and open. So first look, this does not look like the network I showed earlier, but if we go to this help menu, we will find different viewing options. So we can click E on our keyboard to do a tight layout and already it's starting to look a bit nicer. And then we can click P for print mode, which will just give the graph a white background. And then next we can click on any node we like and it'll start to kind of radiate this glow. And then we can go over to this cluster details, click on this plus sign. And so remember that the nodes in this network are actually clusters of data points. And then the way we do the analysis here is we actually have clusters of tickers or in other words, stocks. So down here, you'll see the names of the members of this cluster listed. And so this was generated from that custom tooltip option in that last function call we made. And then here we also have a histogram, which is showing the distribution of the log percent returns of the members of this selected cluster. So right now the weighted average of the log percent returns of each cluster is what generates each node's color. But we could use other statistics. So if we go over here to this node color function, we can click this drop down menu, we could do the standard deviation, which doesn't look too exciting. We could also do the sum which also looks pretty uniform, but then we could also do max. So now we're starting to see some variation. We then might be curious about the clusters that contain members with high returns. So we can click on this yellow node here, and then we can look at these ticker names and maybe do some further analysis. So I'm no financial expert, so I don't have much intuition to offer here, but when working with the data that you are familiar with, you may immediately start to see interesting patterns just by jumping around. And you can really do this all day. You can click on a particular node, see what members are in that cluster, and then you can click on adjacent nodes and see what members are in those clusters. And then you can go back, try out different projection strategies, try out different clustering algorithms, generate new graphs, and then repeat this whole process. All right, so that's basically it. Uh, again, the code for this example is freely available at the GitHub. If you want to learn more, check out other videos in the series. In the next video, I will discuss a another specific TDA technique called persistent homology. If you enjoyed this content, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing this video. Like many of you, I am still learning, so I would also appreciate your questions, concerns, and feedback in the comment section below. And as always, thanks for watching.